here's our message map for today. We're going to look at something called the fabulous 40s. What are these, what's the 40 days and 40 nights all about? We're going to look at the number one, the number two, the number seven, the number 10, and the number 17 today. But we're going to focus on the fabulous 40s. God's response to, re to rebellion is retribution. In this case, it comes in the form of rain. And as God provides retribution, he also provides redemption for his people, his elect. Uh, we're going to look at where the ark landed. It really isn't important as where the ark landed as when it landed. And there's a reason why God repeats these numbers in Scripture. On the first of the month, the 17th and the 27th, he's, he's trying to tell us something. And we're going we're gonna to look at uh, the Hebrew calendar and try to figure out what he's telling us. Number three, God remembered Noah. And he remembers us too. Sometimes does it feel like you're on an ark? Storms all around you, you're in this dark place, you don't really know where you're going. And you're like, is God really in control? Last week we looked at how the ark was non-human powered. There was no sail, there was no motor. You got into the ark and you, you took this huge step of faith and you were going to go into the ark unbeknownst to you during the greatest storm that has ever been. And you're, you're fully at God's, uh, um, you're fully at God's mercy. You have no way to row that ark. You have no way to steer that ark. You are just in, at God's mercy in that ark. And we're going to look a little bit. At, we're going to look at that a little bit today. How God remembers, and then we're going to look at what what is the flood? How does that inform our lives today? How do we be faithful witnesses in relation to this flood? So let's let's uh, turn to your notes, and we'll begin to unpack this. God tells Noah to get the animals on the ark, and then it rains seven days later. So we have to assume that it took seven days for all the animals to to parade for God to parade those animals onto the ark. Noah's probably in the ark, probably putting them in stalls and whatnot during that seven days. And God says, I will send rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and every living thing that I have made I will blot out from the face of the ground. And Noah did all that the Lord had commanded him. Next slide. Now, what does this teach us? This teaches us, what number one, God made everything. It's God's and he will do with it what he wants. Some people say, well, I just don't believe God will ever send anybody to hell. And I'm like, well, you, God will do what he wants to do, and he's going to live by his word. And this is an example. Do you, we don't think God's going to punish people? This is an example to the world. But yeah, God is a, is a God of judgment, but he's also a God of mercy and love. He puts Noah on an ark. God exercises sovereignty over creation. He's going to make it rain. He's also going to make the rain stop. He's also going to make a wind blow. I believe the Grand Canyon was carved by the runoff from Noah's flood. Because if you stand in the Grand Canyon, you can see the layers of, of, of stratum, and you can trace them right across the continental United States, under the ocean, over to the Middle East. The world's surface, the face of the earth, was dramatically changed by the flood. We read that in Psalm, in our call to worship. That God, he lowered, he put the mountains in the valleys at the depths that he wanted them. You know, when I use my garden hose at home, I have no control over where it's going to hit the dirt and what little trails it's going to make. But God does. <laughs> That's how amazing and powerful he is. Well, look at C. God judges the unrighteous and the disobedient. Why am I so adamant about evangelism? Because I know that God judges the disobedient. Now I know sometimes we want to be kind to our neighbors. But in a sense, our neighbor's house is on fire. Sometimes when I'm in a restaurant, I realize this restaurant is, is kind of burning with the flames of hell. They're licking at the door. And what I want to do is kind of, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian and I want to be kind. and I'm just going to tiptoe out of here, even though I know the place is about to burst in the flame. I'm not going to tell anybody because I don't want to upset them. I don't want to disturb them during their meal. We don't want to be those kind of people. We want to be the kind of people that say, God, I know this house is on fire. And I pray, Lord, that you would create divine opportunities for me to meet people and to speak to them about who you are, how you love us, and how you want to guide us away from that fire. Well, like Noah, we have to obey God. What would have happened to Noah if he didn't obey God? He would have died in the flood, right? Well, we're dealing with life and death stuff. 
If people don't obey God, we're, we're, they are going to die. And we're going to read later how Jesus says, do not fear him who could just kill the body. Fear that person who has power over the soul once the body's dead. Remember, we're eternal spirits housed inside of our flesh. Death is not the worst thing that's ever going to happen to me. As a matter of fact, as a Christian, I can't get what I'm living for until I die. Now, I don't want to hasten that. I don't want to be stupid about that. But it also gives me a certain courage about life. So, all these animals went into the ark, two and two, male and female, all flesh went in as God had commanded, and then he shut the door. Now, that's an interesting term, shut the door. It means he quarantined Noah. What was he quarantining him from? He was quarantining him from destruction. But you know why Noah was able to be quarantined from destruction? Because Noah had quarantined, had allowed the Holy Spirit to work in his life and quarantine him from sin while, while before the judgment came. Now, what about our lives? Do you sense God narrowing your path and the things that he tolerated in your life last year? You can sense the Holy Spirit is saying, no more of that for you. I've got a narrower way for you to travel. He's quarantining us from sin. He's quarantining us into the paths of mercy and grace where we can begin to do things that, left to ourselves, we probably would not do. So the fabulous 40s in the scripture, what is that all about? You know what the number 40 in scripture stands for? It stands for completion or fulfillment. Now, in Scripture, we see all these different activities going on in, in, over a period of 40 days and nights. We see testing, trial, judgment, discipline, destruction, all over 40, a 40-day 40 period of time. So, Genesis 7, 4 through 17, the judgment of rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. In Nineveh, God works through Jonah and he gives the Ninevites 40 days before destruction will fall. And they repented. He, they had a 40 day window. Get right with me or else. Numbers 14.34, Israel was disciplined for how long? 40 years. 40 years in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 25, one through three, it says if you're going to punish someone, you give them how many lashes? 40 years. But you know what they, they did? They gave, you, they gave you 39 to make sure they didn't go over the 40. Because God gives you a warning. Don't do more than 40. In Exodus 24, 18 and 34, Moses was given the Ten Commandments during a 40-day period of fasting in God's presence. Ezekiel 29, 9 through 16, the Lord says this. He says, I'm going to judge Egypt for 40 years. Matthew 4, 1 through 2, Jesus was tempted of the devil how many days? While he fasted. Do you know that both King David and King Solomon's reign lasted 40 years? The two greatest kings of Israel. Well, Genesis 7, 2 through 3, Noah is to take seven pairs of all the clean animals and its mate, and seven pairs of, the, of all the clean birds, the sacrificial birds, male and female, to keep their offspring alive on the face of the earth. You know why, why they're called clean and unclean? Do we have any scriptures yet where God explains to Noah what's clean and unclean? There's no, there's, we, we're not at Deuteronomy. We're not at Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers. Where did Noah know this from? Where did he get this? He must, God must have been communicating it. Just like Cain and Abel knew what is the appropriate sacrifice. So these things all re pertain to the ceremonial law. And the ceremonial law was fulfilled when who came? Christ came. Christ fulfilled the ceremonial law. There's three types of laws in the Old Testament. There's ceremonial law, which what this, this clean and unclean thing is about. But all the ceremonial law does is it points to Jesus. It's, it tell, it's trying to show us that God is going to bring his son to the earth and he's going to be the ultimate sacrifice. Then there's the moral law, the Ten Commandments is, is an example of the supreme moral law. 
It's the moral law in a nutshell. Of course, Jesus says, if you love your neighbor as you love yourself, love God first, love your neighbor, you're going to fulfill the moral law. The moral law is something that never goes away. In Christ's millennial kingdom, those of us who will be helping him administer that kingdom, we will, we will be administering his kingdom under the moral law. So when people say, Pastor Wallace, why are you spending so much time talking about the Old Testament? The law has been fulfilled in Christ. I'm like, the ceremonial law, not the moral law. You got to walk, you got to struggle with that every day. And then there's judicial law. How in our civic lives do we work out the moral law? How do we administer human affairs so that we are being just in God's sight under his moral law? That's where the church has really fallen down, in my opinion. The only people that know that is the church. That's why the founding fathers in America said that only Christians should be elected to, to political office. We're the only ones that understand that connection between the moral and the civil. How do you administer in civil law God's moral law? We're going to look at that as our, final, uh, as our fourth point today. What is our responsibility now that we know about the flood? And God is moving us forward in life in relation to it. How can we be faithful witnesses to the Lord? Well, we know we punish the world because it failed his moral law. Do we think he's not going to punish the world again because the world is failing his moral law? No. We have a responsibility as believers. Gentle as a dove, shrewd as a serpent. I don't want to walk into somebody's office with a hammer and start pounding on their desk. I'm a believer in God and you have to obey me. No. We have to be more subtle than that. We have to build relationships. Sometimes relationships can be built very quickly. A man told me years ago, and a woman told me years ago, one was a Christian, one was an atheist, and said, the atheist had been a Methodist minister for 10 years and became an atheist, but he went back to Christ. And he told me, he said, the first day I met you, I wanted to grab you by your collar. I wanted to shake you and say, what happened to me? I used to believe. I don't understand how I got here. And I said to Ed, why would you want to do that the first day you met me? He said, because I perceive that God is using you as his evangelist. I'm not the only one. There's lots of evangelists. And a, and a, a lady told me this years ago, too. She's, I was telling her about this story. And she said, the gift of evangelism is that people will want to walk up to you. and they're gonna, It's all they can do is not to tell you their deepest, darkest secrets. Because they know that they're, that they're being convicted and they know that there's something is wrong. And they have to confess their sin to somebody. And this, he said, so people will walk up to an evangelist. I told you the story. I was doing a, a book signing event in Borders on Broadway in Saratoga Springs and a man walked up to me and told me what he was doing. Put his hands over his mouth and said, oh my gosh, what am I saying? And I told him, sir, I am a prophet of the Most High God. You've come to the right place to make your confession. So, 40 days. Let's go to the next slide. God is going to do two, he's going to walk and chew gum at the same time. In the same instance, he is going to provide retribution and redemption. He's going to, he's going to deliver retribution and redemption through the worst storm in history. And boy, was that a storm. It says, on the very same day, God saved Noah and he judged the earth. On the very same day, he provided retribution and redemption. God can walk and chew gum at the same time. The flood continued 40 days on the earth. The waters increased and bore up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and increased greatly. The waters prevailed. Nothing could withstand them. It must be a horrible, horrible feeling to drown. Feeling your lungs fill with water, and it, there's no air, and you feel like you're going to explode. And you're probably crying to God at that time. Oh, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. And, but the ark door was shut. The demarcation line had been drawn. You were either in the ark or you are now going to be in the storm. And all of your horror, all of your terror, all of your strength, all of your might is not going to save you. 
It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of a living God. And as an evangelist, I try not to let people off that hook. You should be scared. You should feel warning. You should feel terror. Because if you blow this thing about Jesus Christ, a nightmare beyond your wildest imagination is waiting for you when you die. I can't even give it words, the horror story that's waiting for you. Get right with Jesus. He loves you. That's why he's given us his word. And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed upon the mountains, covering them 15 cubits deep. God remembered Noah, though. God remembered Noah. Next slide. You know what that means? It means he was mindful of Noah. He was mindful of Noah and all the beasts and the livestock that were with him in the ark. And the waters continued to abate. And it says, until the 10th month, and God repeats it, in the 10th month, on the first day. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh, and nothing that was created was created without the Word. What's the number 10 tell us? Well, 10 is the number of completion. 40 is fulfillment, 10 is completion. Number one symbolizes primacy. I, God, have control over this, and I'm now going to bring it to an end. I, I have completed my judgment. God remembered Noah. Why do you think the Bible tells us that God remembered Noah? If you were in the ark for 377 days, you're thinking, who forgot you? <laughs> I mean, after the first couple of days, you're like, well, you know, this is kind of a trial. Maybe it's an adventure. After a week, after a month, after six months, nine months, 12 months, 14 months and some change. They only counted their months by 30 days in those days. You can do the math on that pretty easily. You're thinking, God forgot me. I mean, I have a trial that goes on a couple of days. And I'm like, I'm, I swear I'm an orphan. <laughs> I thought I was a child of God. What am I, what's happening to me? What God does, he builds into us patience, long-suffering. That means I, I'm learning how to put up with people's mess for a longer and longer period of time. <laughs> God remembered Noah probably because him, him and his family are wondering, hey, what's going on here? Can you imagine you're Noah, right? And what are your sons and their wives saying to you? How long is this going to go on? Did that burn? <laughs> if, if you, you know how you travel someplace with your kids? And your kids go, are we there yet? Are we there yet? My oldest daughter, we were going to Washington, D.C. I had some, her and some of the cousins in the back seat. And I think the women were all riding together. And I, 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 was, I like the kids anyway, so I'm driving with a lot of the kids. And my daughter's just talking and talking. And everybody's like, Deb, shut up. We're trying to sleep. And she's just talking and talking and talking. So I reached back and I started, I grabbed what I thought was her knee. And I began to squeeze. And so she's like, well, you think that hurts? I'm squeezing hard. <laughs> Finally, one of the cousins go, Uncle Earl, you got my leg! <laughs> <laughs> the kids all get together and they still tell, still tell stories about that. Um, so, here, let's take an open book test. When your trial has gone on for a period of time, do you say, Boy, this feels great. God is squeezing me and making me into finer, uh, finer gold. Or do we do B? Did God forget me? Certainly if God loves me, I wouldn't be feeling like this. Or do we do this? Do we do C? Someone's to blame for this, and boy, are they going to get it. <laughs> or do you do D? What did I do to deserve this? I mean, I, I know I do a lot of things. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> and then, what can I do to make it stop? Next slide. Was the ark an adventure? 
first couple of days. <laughs> hey, we're camping. <laughs> Being on the ark must have been, there's another test. Was it A, a great adventure? At first, maybe. Hey, had they ever sailed before? No. And this is a violent storm. Can you imagine the buckets? <laughs> the buckets that they're using, because they're, they're seasick. They had no Febreze back then. Oh my gosh, no Febreze. But they, remember, they covered the inside with pitch because that was gonna help some, some of the smell. What about being scared? I mean, did, did no one know that I had to build some hooks into the side and put ropes and tie myself to the, because to the, sh the ship is going all over the place? I mean, can you imagine that? Do you think you might have been overwhelmed taking care of all those animals? You know, a lot of the experts believe that, that God made the am animals go into hibernation. But even so. Do you think you might have felt cool, smooth, and winning because, hey, after all, I'm God's man. <laughs> I'm on the ark. The Bible says the Lord opposes the proud. When I was a young Christian, I would sense God calling me to something. I'd look in the mirror and I'd say, wow, I must be growing up in Christ. I must be becoming somebody because the Lord wants to use me. And he opposes the proud. <laughs> Now when God wants to use me, I say, well, he must be scraping the bottom of the bucket now. <laughs> He's gone to all the more qualified people. No, a healthy self-esteem is that I'm a sinner. I'm like Noah. We know, last week we looked at that, right? Noah was a sinner, but he, was, he had imputed righteousness. He believed, and God credited to him his righteousness, just as we're going to see uh, with Abraham. Thank God, right? That's how we're all in. So the Bible says, got air rat down here somewhere? I think we, did, I, did I miss the word? Oh, you're right. You don't have any. I took it out of your notes. So the exact location where the ark landed is the subject of much research. Many famous people have tried finding that ark. Marco Polo went on an expedition once to try to find that ark. Um... Oh, I got a bunch of names here. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, um, archives of the Ark sightings. Flavius Josephus writes about it. The Arminians call this place the place of descent for the Ark being saved in that place and its remains are being shown by the inhabitants of that place. People are going up there back and forth looking at it. Barossus the, the, the Chaldean, the Babylonian, said this. He described the flood and he said, it is said there is still some part of this ship in Armenia in the mountain, and he names a tribe, and that those people carry off pieces of the bitumen, and which they take away and they use chiefly as omelets uh, for averting mischief. They're using them as, as uh, religious symbols to uh, ward off evil spirits. Haranamis, the Egyptian historian who wrote the Phoenician Antiquities, he said, he mentions the Ark in his works and how people were trying to find it. Nicholas of Damascus in his 96th book said this, there is a great mountain in Armenia called Beris upon which is reported the many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved and that one who was carried in an ark came on shore upon the top of it and that the remains of the timbers are preserved to this day. This might be the man about whom Moses wrote Moses, the legislator of the Jews, wrote. It's interesting. Uh, this guy doesn't even mention Noah by name, but he knows Moses' law. Marco Polo, 1254 through 1324 is when he lived. He explains why it's so difficult to pinpoint the location of the ark. In his book, The Travels of Marco Polo, he says in the heart of the Armenian mountain range, the mountain's peak is shaped like a cube or a cup on which Noah's Ark is said to have rested, whence it is called the mountain of Noah's Ark. It, the mountain, is so broad and long that it takes more, to two day, more than two days to go around it. On the summit, the snow lies so deep all the year round that no one can ever climb it. This snow never entirely melts, for new snow is falling on the old, and the old level continues to rise. Sir Walter Raleigh wrote, he took several chapters in his book, The History of the World, to try to pinpoint the location of the Ark. He knew it was in Asia. He knew it was in Armenia. 
He says the Orients, especially since Armenia is not technically east of the plain of Shinar or Mesopotamia, but more north northwest. I could go on and on and on. In 1829, Dr. Frederick Perot, his journey to Ararat. 1876, Dr. James Boyce, a historian, statesman, diplomat, explorer, and professor of civic law at Oxford, climbed there twice trying to find it. He says he found a piece of wood. In 1883, a Turkish commission surveying the Ark uh, believed that they saw 20 to 30 feet of it protruding out of an ice flow, out of a glacier. In 1887, on his third attempt to find the Ark, Prince Nuri of Baghdad found it on the highest peaks, he says, in Ararat. You know, um, Tim LaHaye has compiled a bunch of information on people over throughout time who have gone to uh, explore the Ark. In 1952, Herod Williams went and he met, talked to a man named Haji Yerman, who said during 1916, he had helped guide three scientists to the Ark. Upon finding the Ark sticking out of a glacier near the summit, the scientists flew into a rage, and they futilely tried to destroy it. They took an oath to keep the discovery a secret that they would murder anyone who revealed it. George uh, Hagopayan, who was just a boy, said he visited the Ark with his uncle. In 1916, six Turkish soldiers climbed Ararat and saw the Ark. In 1916, Vladimir Rus uh, Russian guy, took how, told how he and other Russian aviators sighted the Ark and they went and reported it to the Tsar and the Tsar dispatched an exposition. The exposition reportedly took pictures of it, came back and gave the pictures to the Tsar, but a few days later, the Bolshevik Revolution arrested the Tsar and, and uh, took him and his family off to be killed, and the, the, the evidence was destroyed. When I was in Germany in 1976 through, uh, well, 75 through 77, I can't remember what year it was, but I saw a film of German soldiers testifying during World War II that they were crossing the mountain and that they saw the Ark. They said there were a couple of battalions of us. They said, we fell down in the snow and began worshiping God, and our Nazi masters kicked us and punched us and pulled us and said, get up, you've seen nothing. And he says, but we know what we were looking at. I could go on and on and on, but I'm going to keep moving. Satellite images have captured it too. 1949, 55, 73. Anyway, there's a guy on YouTube, and he, um, he lands in Israel, and he just goes over to, to uh, Armenia, and he asks some driver to take him up the mountain, and he flies a drone over what he believes is the silhouette of the Ark. And he shows it right on YouTube. So, anyway, what is this thing about the seventh month on the 17th day? Interesting. Why does God give us these, what seem to be, perhaps random dates. Well, there are two Jewish calendars. In, there's the civic calendar, which begins in our September. I believe it's Tishri, Tish, Tishri in the uh, Hebrew. And then there's the religious calendar, which God starts in Exodus. He says in Exodus 12, 2 and in Exodus 13, 4, today, the month of Abib, you are going to, you're going to be set free and I want you to begin to count for religious purposes, for religious ceremony, this is your first month. He says on the, four, on the 10th day, you take a lamb and you hold it to the 14th day and you sacrifice it. How many days was Christ in the tomb? If we're killing the lamb on the 14th, what is the date that Christ comes out of that tomb? 14, 15, 16, 17. God is having that ark land on resurrection day. Amen? He's not wasting, he's not, God doesn't waste any symbols. The Old Testament reveals the New Testament. The Old Testament is Christ concealed. The New Testament is Christ revealed. There's a reason why God keeps repeating this on the seventh month, on the 17th day. But the seventh month has really become the first month for, for, for ceremonial purposes, which is the month of March or April, which is when we celebrate Resurrection Day. So, got your feelings, okay? 
Let's read Exodus 12, 1 through 6. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's house, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without spot or blemish, or without blemish. That's a sinless lamb. Sinless. Jesus is the sinless lamb. It's got to be a male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. That's why God says he's my only begotten son. It's got to be a male. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. In Mark 14, 2, and in Matthew 26, 5, the, what I call the pair of the park, the politically appointed religious establishment, or the politically appointed religious crowd, they don't want to arrest Jesus during the Passover because they said the people will riot. He's a very popular guy. We've got to do this at night and get him away from the people. They don't want a public scene. They have an uneasy alliance with the Roman government. The, the deal is, is we can keep the people in line if you let us practice some of our religion. And who better to guide the people to practice it than me? So appoint me to be the high priest, and I'll keep the people in line for you, Roman government, while we kind of practice our religion. There could have been a good win-win there, but the politically appointed religious crowd, nah. They're doing that because they want power and control. And they'll use God's law to get it if, that, if it takes that. Remember, Adam Weishaupt said, we need to control finance. You want to control the people? You want to control a nation? You control their finances. With the finances, you can control who becomes the politician. You can control the communications. You can be, with the communications, you can, you, can, you can control who becomes the politicians. Once you have the politicians, you can control the educational system. And with the educational system, you actually can, can control the religion. But Jesus knows that he has to be crucified on the 14th because he's coming out of the tomb on the 17th. And so Jesus pushes the envelope. He goes and turns over the tables in the temple. You take an evil person and you mess with their money, they're going to kill you. <laughs> at, 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 at the Last Supper, Jesus says to Judas, take the morsel, whatever thou doest, doest quickly. My timing is now. I don't care what the politically appointed religious crowd wants. I am going to be, I am going to be crucified on my father's Passover. So in Genesis 8, 13 through 19, we read this. In the 601st year of the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried from the earth. And in the second month, on the 27th day of the month, the earth had dried out. And then God said to Noah, go out from the ark, you and your wife and your sons and your sons' wives with you. Bring out with you every living thing. Jesus died so we can live. Bring out with you every living thing. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. So Noah went out and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing and every... Jesus said, those that my father give me, gives me, no one can pluck them from my hand. Look at all the words here. Every. 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 Are you in Christ? Feel like your life's, feel like your life's an ark right now? Trust him, because he's got this for you and for me. What about this second month stuff? In Numbers, it tells us a census of Israel's warriors are going to be taken. Ezra 3.8, the second month is a new beginning for the rebuilding of the temple. Exodus 16 the second month is the beginning of the provision for manna to fall. 
First Kings 6, 1, Solomon began to build God's house in the second month. Well, the ark lands and Noah begins to send out birds. Let's take a look at these birds. The raven reflects one of two things, maybe both. God can walk in two gum at the same time. What does the law do? Did it satisfy us? The law is a tutor that tells us we needed something more. So he lets the raven out, and like the law, it goes back even, even more specific than the law. The Bible says that Satan is a roaring lion doing what? <coughs> Seeking whom he may devour. What does that raven do? It never comes back to the ark. It lands on this carcass, flies around, lands on that carcass, flies around, lands on the next carcass. It's a picture of Satan. In Job chapter 2, verse 2, the Lord said to Satan, From where have you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, Well, from going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down on it. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be alert and be sober-minded. The enemy, your devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. You first read about the raven going out and you say, No, don't send that one out. But Satan is called the god of this world. Small g-o-d in Ephesians 2, 2. What about the doves? Were there three doves, or was it one dove sent three times? And I think the evidence points to the latter, but it really doesn't matter. You know the first time you hear the gospel, the Holy Spirit approaches you with the gospel? How many of us received Christ the first time we heard it? Or did we argue with people? Did we scoff? The first dove is no, there's no advantage gained for Noah. He knows that I need something else. I'm waiting. The second time the dove goes out, it comes back with an olive branch. An olive branch is a symbol of peace. We have peace with God through Christ our Lord. It's not peace with people. If you don't have peace with God, you're not going to have peace with people. The third dove. Now salvation is actionable. Now you can leave your mother and father. A woman shall leave her home, and the two shall become one. You're got, now you can go do something. Now the information is actionable. Three-legged stool of understanding in the, in the uh, three-dimensional leader. The first time you hear new information for the first time, it's like sitting on a one-legged stool. Not a bar stool, a stool that should have three legs on it. And you fall off that stool because there's only one leg. The second time I give you new information that you haven't heard before, it's like sitting on a two-legged stool. I'm holding a stool, I tell you to sit down, and you sit on it, and you don't feel quite comfortable, and you pick up the stool and you say, what on earth is going on with the stool? The first time I sit you on a one-legged stool, I hold the stool, and as soon as you sit down, I let go. You slam to the floor, metaphorically speaking, and then you pick up the stool and you want to hit the messenger. It's all part of how people receive information. Three-legged stool. First time they hear it, they don't like it. They don't accept it. We raise psychological barriers against new information. That's what's so challenging about Christian growth. Actually, I look at how God is helping us to grow. I'm amazed because I know what I'm like. I'm a scoffer. I don't believe that. I it can't be true. I always thought this. How can the word say that? I don't know. <laughs> and how does God get us through that? He grabs you by your neck and shakes you every which way but loose. In a nice way. <laughs> I pray, Lord, don't let me go. The worst thing that could happen is for me to, to be stiff-necked and to say, get your hands off me, God. I don't want to go my own way. I would be leaving the ark prematurely. I've done that. <laughs> Thank God he helps me to swim back. <laughs> so, Let's go, let's move forward. What does this whole flood thing mean for us in terms of witnessing for Jesus? Look at what God says to Noah. 
when he gets off the flood, when he gets off the boat. What does God promise to do? He has a barbecue. You know, some of the scholars believe Noah was saying, oh my gosh, is God going to do this to us again? And please, Lord. And, and, and the, some of the scholars believe that God answered Noah's prayer. And reminding us. So, look at what he says. While the earth remains, I'm going to secure the four seasons. What is sustainability telling us? That this isn't true. The whole thing about, oh, the environment's going to collapse. Man is bad. Who, who brought the rain? Hey, when uh, Elijah prayed, and there wasn't rain on the earth for three and a half years, who stopped the rain? God did. Because Elijah did not have the, the technology to emit fumes into the atmosphere, as they say we are doing, and using that as an excuse for climate change. Trust me, man is not affecting the environment. This is God's environment. And look at what he's promising us. And so they lie to us and they say, oh, we're going to disrupt this with human behavior. So therefore, we got to kill some people to keep this from happening. It's an evil lie of Satan. And for the life of me, I do not understand why more churches are not standing up and defending God. Because this is what he says. Contrary to the cult of sustainability. It's a very simple thing. I was reading something by Calvin Coolidge, a former president. And he said that God's law, you don't have to be a lawyer to understand it. He says it is as plain and simple as the Ten Commandments. It's all there for it. Now, what's our responsibility? People in our society are taking so many things for granted that are against God's word. Why? Because of the church, we have fallen down. We have not kept in the forefront of their minds the things that God says. He goes, I am going to secure the seasons for you. There will be seed time. You know what that means? You're going to have food. A person wrote a book, said that, um, uh, that there's a shortage of beans in the world. And I said, no. There's, he, had, he, he admitted there's no shortage of beans in the world. There's seed time. What you're talking about is a government-caused shortage, a regulation-caused shortage. And he had to admit it. So I said to that man, why are you advocating in your book that there are 2.2 billion too many people in the world? You're actually saying of the 7 billion people in the world, five of us need to get together and kill the other two before it's too late. He goes, I, I'm not, I don't mean that. Well, what I mean is that, I've, I, I, look girl, I just sat at the highest seats of government and power. I'm just trying to warn the world what's about to happen to it. And I said, your book contains no warning. You are extolling the virtues of these lies against God. 